It is Thursday here on the Locked On Network, and you know what that means. It's crossover Thursday for this star-studded affair between the Miami Dolphins and the Buffalo Bills in Week 4. I, Kyle Krabs, will be joined by Joe Marino of Locked On Bills for a crossover exploration into this Week 4 AFC East matchup. You are Locked On Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. This crossover Thursday episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. I'm Joe Marino, host of Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs host of Locked On Dolphins, and we are here for a much-anticipated crossover Thursday conversation to get everyone ready for a big early-season AFC East contest between the 3-0 and Miami Dolphins, who traveled to Orchard Park to take on the 2-1 and Buffalo Bills, Kyle Krabs. What's going on, my guy? What's up, uh, dude? You know, it feels like we haven't talked in a while. Uh, really? In reality, we do lock on scouting together on a daily basis. So, uh, and we've probably done this show four times this week already, mm, like just in five. our personal conversations and pre-show for the other show and all that. So I, I think we've had a nice dress rehearsal to kind of pick each other's brains to have as compelling of a conversation as we possibly can. Yeah. And uh, obviously excited for this football game. I, I think there's um, AFC conference magnitudes that are at stake we won't see each other again until week 18 so there's a lot that's going to unfold after this game and uh obviously selfishly for for my standpoint with the dolphins this is a good litmus test of where this team's at well, obviously off to an impressive start and to start this conversation let's get into the biggest storyline for each team entering this contest kyle Reno Miami Dolphins coming off of 70 points against Denver. What's the biggest storyline for Miami? Yeah, I think you could go a number of different directions. If you were going to be focused on what happened last week, I think you'd probably uh, be justified in in doing so and the sustainability of that, if that's a question. But I'll I'll go a little more narrow. Uh, I I think the biggest storyline for Miami is what this running game has turned into over the last two weeks after uh, all of the talk in the offseason about reinvestment in the running game and all of the rumors of Dalvin Cook and Jonathan Taylor and DeAndre Swift. And uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting like three other backs that they've called on. Uh, they called on Josh Jacobs, apparently. So like they were really interested in backs. Well, lo and behold, like Raheem Mostert has been a monster to start the season. I, I thought he ran really well down the stretch last year before he injured. I think it was his wrist against the Jets. He had a good performance against New York or and not against uh, New York before he got hurt, but he had a good new performance against Buffalo uh, in that that late December game at Orchard Park. So that was kind of the way, like, Bills fans, the last time you saw him, that's how he's been running since. And for Miami to come out week one and throw the ball as much as they did 466 passing yards against the Chargers, then they come, a, come out against New England, and New England tries some stuff structurally to try to oppose the rushing off or the passing offense. And you saw Miami get between the tackles and really challenge them downhill. Well, then you had Denver come out, and they played with safeties, two high safeties, but they played with a lot of depth. They had an extra hat kind of in the box area, and their linebackers are like Denver or like New England, physical thumper downhill types. Well, then they ran outside the tackles. They ran crack toss a bunch against Denver. So they ran outside on the perimeter against Denver with success. They ran in between the tackles against new England because they were running these three high safety structures with success and 350 rushing yards against Denver. Like I certainly don't expect that to be the standard by any case or point, but my, it's been a long time since Miami ran like that. And for that to have manifested itself, I think gives the Dolphins a lot of confidence that they can go into any personnel matchup and move the ball because it's, if you want to play numbers and coverage, okay, we've shown we can run between the tackles or we can run outside. Or if you want to stuff the box, we've got explosive speed and Jalen Waddle will be back this week. 
and we like our matchups on the outside. The Dolphins, a two-dimensional offense, right? Multifaceted. It's not just throwing the ball. It's the threat of running it as well. And what was it, 350 rushing yards against Denver? Yeah. I mean, come on. The National Football League, that's insane. And so, obviously, the Bills will have a lot to deal with with this Miami offense. And, Kyle, for me, as I consider the biggest storyline for the Bills entering this game, it's how well this defense has performed with Sean McDermott now kind of not kind of taking over completely the play calling and the coordination of the defense. Leslie Frazier had a great stretch as the Bills defensive coordinator, Mm -hmm. but now this is Sean McDermott's unit and it's been really impressive through three games. Let me give you some numbers here. So through three games, the Bills have allowed 35 points. and That includes a punt return for a touchdown total in three games. They forced a turnover on 29% of the drives that they've faced. They've only given up points on 22.6% of drives. So it's more likely so you to turn the ball over against the Bills than it is for you to get points. They've allowed the second fewest first downs in the NFL. They've conceded only two red zone touchdowns this year in eight trips, 28.6% red zone touchdown percentage against their defense. Number two in DVOA, the lowest blitz percentage in the NFL, but the highest sack percentage. The unit's playing good. They're playing fast. They're playing physical, and guys are making plays. Now, listen, I fully understand that this comes against Zach Wilson and Jimmy Garoppolo, and Sam Howell, right? That's There's something to be said for that, and that none of it carries over to Miami and, of course, all the unique challenges that they present. And those metrics are probably going to look a lot different after week four, but this is a defense that's playing with a lot of confidence. There's an edge to the way that they're performing, and they're playing well, and they're going to have to play well if they're going to limit this Miami offense that's coming in hot, right? I mean, you talk about the Bills' defense being hot, Miami's offense is hot. 70 points, 70. I mean, 70, right? I've said that to you a hundred times this week. 70 points. Yeah. That doesn't happen in the NFL. Hasn't happened. 1964, then before that, 1950, and before that was in the 40s. Like, that's unprecedented. And you have two very confident situations, whether it's the Bills on defense and this Miami offense, they're going to go head to head. Something's got to give on Sunday. And so very excited about the trajectory of this Bills defense. And, of course, they get Von Miller back. Like, he's eligible to come off the pup list after this game. And so a lot of momentum for the Bills on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I think you have this clash of strength on strength. And and it's what you'd expect with Sean McDermott, right? There's been a certain threshold of performance defensively and obviously making the change from Leslie Frazier and and Sean McDermott kind of putting his own imprint on – what's new this year and that's paying big dividends and and I'm looking forward to stoppable unstoppable force meeting unmovable object because well you, you went down the laundry list of all these incredible metrics through three games for Buffalo and Miami's 78 percent on 14 trips for red zone touchdown conversion rate and that's first in the NFL for that their 3.64 points per drive is first in the NFL obviously they're first in score it's the second highest amount of points the team has scored in the first three games of any team in NFL history. And Jason Sanders missed two kicks against the New England Patriots that would have given them first place. They were two points off of that. So um, there, there is a lot and you get into the matchups, especially on like with strength on strength in that regard. And that's not to gloss over Josh Allen and the historical success he's had against the Dolphins. Like we readily acknowledge that, but just Miami, they've given up one sack in three three games. And Buffalo's pass rush and how impactful it's been. Like, there's so many matchups that we can get into, and, and obviously we will do that next. But um, I, I just think this is going to be one of the early candidates for game of the year. I, I think there's a lot here. There's a lot on the line. There's a lot to prove. There's familiarity. There's divisional rivalry. Yeah. And this this is a big game for both sides. Yeah, especially with Miami coming in 3-0. and The Bills are 2-1 and with a division loss, right? So you feel like a lot of urgency here for Buffalo to not fall to 0-2 in the division while Miami's 2-0. and So a lot, uh, a lot on the line here in this early season AFC East showdown between the Bills and Dolphins. Kyle mentioned matchups. We're going to talk about those here in just a moment. But first, we got to tell you about Harry's. Guys, listen, I know I have a beard, but I still got to shave. You can't be having neck beard. You can't be having that cheek fuzz or else that just looks sloppy. 
And my go-to for a great shave at a great price is a razor from Harry's delivered right to my front door. And folks really enjoyed using Harry's razors. And you got to check out their starter set. Head to harrys.com slash NFL, and you can get a starter set for just $3. It includes a five-blade German-engineered razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover. And look, Harry's makes skin skincare products as well that will give you the best shave ever. They have creams, washes, lotions, all of that to help keep your skin healthy and hydrated. And folks, the razors are also really, really sharp. The eighth shave with the razor is just as sharp as the first. And look, there's no reason not to try Harry's. They have the highest customer satisfaction rating in the shaving industry, and they're also offering a no-risk trial. So get your best shave ever with Harry's razors and skincare products. Get a $13 starter set for just $3 at harrys.com slash NFL. That's harrys.com slash NFL for a $3 starter set. All right, Kyle, let's talk about the matchups that are going to decide this football game. And if I can have the floor first, I would like to take it. You're the home team. You can do whatever you want. So listen, we you know we love to talk about players, right? This guy versus this guy, and we'll get into some of that. But for me, I want to start this conversation with Sean McDermott against Mike McDaniel. And yeah. you know I've talked to you all week about how do you stop the, the Miami Dolphins offense? And stop's probably the wrong word. How do you slow them down? How do you contain it? How do you limit it, right? And I've shared some ideas with you. But what I've kind of come back to is this. What does Mike McDaniel want you to do? And I understand he's got counters, right? And we've been through, well, if you play it this way, they can do this. And if you do that, they can do this. I get that. But if I'm Sean McDermott, the question I'm asking myself this week is, what do they want me to do? And then I'm not going to do that. And I think that's where it becomes important. I still think you have to be yourself defensively. I don't think you can come out there and play a, a game defensively that is not within your identity and what you're not constructed to do. And I think the Bills have told you what they want to be. They want to play a lot of zone defense. They want to disguise. They want to rush for. They want to give you simulated pressures. And they want to trust that they can be disciplined within their scheme and play fast, right? I think you have to play fast against Miami. And so whatever Sean McDermott can cook up to achieve that is going to be important. And what's difficult about this conversation for me is I can usually identify the what and then talk about the how, right? The how is the hard part here. <laughs> That's right. where it really gets really, really challenging. But I think you have to be true to yourself and who you are as a defense. And I think from there, it's about trying to get to a, to come off of that first read. He's hitting that first read at an absurd 80% of the time this year. That's not a knock on Tua. That's a great scheme. That's great pre-snap processing by Tua and turning that into great post-snap decisions, right? That's, that's not a knock. How do you get him out of that where he's comfortable and he's going to read it and rip it and guys get to their spots really, really quick? Whatever wrinkles that you can come up with to get Tua to hold onto the ball for another fraction of the second to give yourself a chance as a pass rush to give yourself a chance to put two in a situation where he doesn't want to doesn't have to go to the ball with the to the place where he wants to with the ball initially i think that's going to give your yourself the best chance so for me i start this conversation with Sean McDermott versus Mike McDaniel yeah i, I certainly think that's the chess match that will go such a long way beyond just the execution on the field of winning the football game and i think what to to kind of piggyback off what you said New England accomplished what you talked about, where we want to be true to who we are. And simultaneously, we want to not give you the low hanging fruit. We don't want to play a ton of man coverage, right? You, you, you played, you saw what happened when the Chargers manned up Tyreek. Yikes. Yeah. And so you, you don't want to do that. And New England, I think, what was challenging for me going into the game against New England was it's like they the Patriots are that team that what do you do best and we're going to take that away. But even when you try to do that against the personnel that Miami has, Miami can still in a lot of ways dictate terms because of what they have in the skill group. And you saw that against New England and it manifests itself. But they were able to effectively say, Ben, don't break. We're going to play zone. We can get physical with Christian Gonzalez and try to play physical with Tyreek Hill at times and then play safety over the top. And they did that, and they had some success slowing Tyreek Hill down. He had four for 40 and a touchdown. 
right? Versus 225. Sign right me now. up for that. You tell me right. Tyreek Hill has four for 40 and a touchdown. I will take that every time. Right. And and that's that's what and the touchdown was quick game in the red zone on the three yard line with a good anticipatory throw where they used motion to create leverage. The 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 key for Buffalo is how you gonna how are you going to play the motion? And I'm curious, the thing that I, I'd be really interested in in your thoughts on is you talk about having to be physical with these receivers to try to disrupt the timing, but are you when there's all of this dead sprint motion at the snap, does Buffalo, do you feel, have personnel that would allow them to play soft within the contact window, not up on the line of scrimmage? So, so many people think about we got to collision these receivers, we got to throw right. off the timing, we, and it's you're going to press them at the line of scrimmage. And I understand like the speed of the Dolphins receivers with Waddle and Hill can scare you to death if you're going to say, well, we're going to give them free releases. But if you just play with a little bit more cushion, Miami's honey holes is 12 to 16 yards, where if you play off a little bit and you disrupt the timing and then you sync with the stem after they go through the contact window, you can try to squeeze and compress that a little bit and force Miami to take even more shallow throws underneath. I think that's where if McDermott can find a way to disrupt timing without creating the voids between mm -hmm. the second and third level of defense, however yeah. that ends up looking. I think that's a schematic approach that with as experienced of a secondary as the Bills have, and I know Christian Benford's still a young player, um, but do you think about the safeties in Hyde and Poyer and Tredavious White and Mike uh, Matt Milano and what he can do in the middle of the field to kind of attack those in-breaking routes? That for me is where I'm really fascinated to see if McDermott tries anything in that capacity. Yeah, I, I think you have to not focus in on creating jams, or that's where you're going to get really right. cooked. It's right. the soft press and staying, you know, having a little bit of help over top. I think that's your recipe. But does anybody have press man corners that can really get up in the face and try to jam Hill and Waddle? I think that's a recipe for disaster. I don't think so. Yeah, but, I don't think those people exist. So, like, right now, hat tip to Christian Gonzalez. I thought he played a great game. And you think about Sauce Gardner, who we're both very familiar with. That's a long, physical, super big radius. Like those guys, the big long guys, I think can impact a little bit because that also so can run four three. Right, they're yeah. not the Richard yeah. Sherman ones. That's the it's Correct. the the ones Correct. that can actually yeah, move. Not not the half turn. Yeah, cover Side three. Saddle, right, right. Yeah, not we're not doing that. So. Uh, I think when I think about Buffalo's personnel, I, I don't know that that's the answer. So therefore, I do think soft press and forcing the completion, try to take away the, right, when you think about the, the quickness to release, it's 2.2 seconds for Tua Tungvaloa through 101 passing attempts. And yet he's fourth highest average depth of target amongst quarterbacks in the NFL. Insane. Insane. So make it shorter. Force more of the work to be done for all of the narrative that Tua Tungvaloa is just a yak merchant who gets his receivers that pick up all these yards after catch. Yeah, Tyreek Hill had a banger of a touchdown run because Buffalo had Kareem Jackson backpedal to Athens, Georgia, playing half field coverage when they put 70 on him. But the vast majority is chunk, chunk, chunk. You look up, you go from the minus 17 to the plus 35 in three completions. Yep. And there's decent run after catch, but force this to come more on the backs of shallow completions within nine and under as compared to 12 to 16. The other thing that I wanted to bring up in this segment, and we talked a lot about Bill's defense against Miami offense is Josh Allen. Josh Allen oh, still yeah. plays oh, for the Bills. Oh, yeah, by the way. Right. Like, <laughs> like. Miami presents a world of problems, and we're certainly mm -hmm. fixating on that, and I totally get it. Josh Allen's still the quarterback for the Bills, and he's had a lot of success against Miami. And yeah, I come on, don't sell him short. A lot of success is in a lot of success against Miami. He's had a lot of success against Miami. And you know, he's still capable of throwing haymakers and scoring a lot of points himself. And so there's a two-edged sword with that because we know Josh Allen can go out and make a ton of plays and score points, but sometimes when he wants to be aggressive. That's where things can get dicey. And obviously, turning over the football in a game like this is a recipe for absolute disaster. So 
Josh Allen playing smart, aggressive football against Miami, probably including him in the run game. I think that's one of my big keys for the Bills this week is, you know, Fangio wants to play lighter boxes, make it even make it even more problematic potentially by including Josh Allen in the run game, which they haven't really done through three games this season. So a little attention for Josh Allen here well, and, and, and his existence in this game. And I would love in segment three to just expand on that just a yeah. little bit more, but I know we got to get to the next break. We do. We got to tell you about prize picks. Prize picks is the funnest, easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Folks, the f- format is awesome. I love the format. It's just you versus the numbers. It's not you against thousands of other players, including pros, including sharks. It's just you versus the numbers. All you do is you select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and you place your entry. That's it. Doesn't take long. You can make an entry in under a minute. And when you win, the withdrawals are super, super quick and easy. Love watching football. Love it even more when I have a chance to get a prize picks entry going into the game. It just makes it that much more exciting. So go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Gal, you mentioned you wanted to expand on that. The floor is yours. Yeah, just the the Buffalo offense and versus the Miami defense and what that looks like. And I think you did see Miami's defensive performance normalize a little bit after week one where Kellen Moore came in with a bunch of stuff that was not on tape with new personnel. And they go for four, 433, 30 first downs, 233 yards rushing the football. Well, you look up the last two weeks and and the Patriots and Broncos, and I know that game script for Denver didn't really lend itself particularly well for running the ball, although it was 21-10 and Denver had the ball in plus territory with five minutes left in the first half. So 30 minutes of mildly competitive football. And They had had 21 in the first 25 minutes, and then they scored. They What is that? We're not math. Another another 14 before they scored 35 in each half. So 49 points in the last 35 minutes of the game? Correct. Oof. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. The Patriots and Broncos combined across 120 minutes of football have ran the ball for about 150 yards. So it has normalized a little bit. Now, I do think from a defensive structure standpoint, the Dolphins are going to have one or two choices that they're going to make. They can either play, and I kind of expect them to do this, play coverage the way they played against the Chargers. And if you think back to after the Chargers game happened, a lot of the questions from the Chargers side of things was, what the heck is this? Kellen Moore came in and they were supposed to run a big play offense. And Justin Herbert still looks like he's running Joe Lombardi's offense. Mm -hmm. That's because that's what Miami gave them. And I think the Chargers and Kellen Moore and Justin Herbert did an excellent job throughout the course of 60 minutes to take what the defense gave them, run the ball, They ran for 233 and take a bunch of underneath completions. They had one shot to Keenan Allen on an out and up up the left sideline. That was the explosive play. It was the only explosive play that they had in the the passing game. So that's the choice Miami makes is do you play it structurally the same way that you played another freakishly athletic, big-armed quarterback and dare them to play 60 minutes of patient football and run the ball? If they do that, Buffalo has a great chance to um, run the ball with a lot of success. And I know they've ran the ball for a lot of yardage over the last two weeks as well themselves. But if they, the the question they have to ask themselves is Javon Holland has, is on like all pro pace with his play. He's been outstanding. Leads the team in tackles by 11. He's forced a bunch of turnovers already. The closer he is to the line of scrimmage, the better he is. And Miami has to make this decision of how do you balance getting him low and in the nickel and on the second level? And how do you balance that with playing two high split field coverages that take away explosive plays? And that will be, I think, the chess piece for Miami and Vic Fangio is how do they choose to implement Javon Holland? And if you remember, it was the second game they played, I believe. Javon Holland, Buffalo came out after half with the ball, and Javon Holland was the one that tackled Josh Allen on third down when they were backed up in minus territory on a really critical third down scramble that Josh Allen had. First time in my life I've seen a Dolphins defender get Josh Allen down one-on-one in the open field. We, and, we've, we've had conver- you and I have had conversations yes. about that play yeah, yeah, multiple times. Yeah, that element 
in this game, you have to find a way to have it. I don't know what that looks like, but that's the question for Miami defensively when Buffalo has the ball. All right. Anything else matchup wise that you want to get into here? I mean, yeah, about a billion other things. Right. The Bills right. pass rushers and the Dolphins offensive line. Teron Armstead came back last week and looked great. Austin Jackson's uh, a reanimated NFL player of competency. Well, AJ is, Epines is coming. AJ Epines is coming. <laughs> and Iowa and USC and the, what was it? The Holiday right. Bowl. Whatever that was. Yeah. F four sacks for Epines in the Some, bowl. Game. Something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a billion things in this storyline uh, for storylines. Well, let me I at least ask hit, you. I think me, we hit the biggest stuff. Let me ask you one question though, right? Because the, Tua hasn't been sacked, right? And I think that's surprising to a lot of people. Is he been sacked time. one time? One time. Real? Was it like Patriots, a regular Ma- sack? Matthew, Matthew Judon got him once on a. That's exactly right. I remember that play now. That, now that you said it. So what's the story here? I mean, obviously he's getting the ball out extremely fast, but. It, what what is it like what's what's the success here for Tua and just not seeing any pressure and not is it the pre-snap stuff is well, it the trigger it's a little bit of everything it's the quickness of the release he's had really good feel in the pocket he's had two he had one against the chargers where he steps up and throws that haymaker down the sideline yeah. on third and 10 with the game on the line and then he had the t- the t- the touch pass to Braxton Berrios on the whip wheel that they ran on the two minute offense where he's sliding off platform, stepping up in the pocket. They have converted to running less RPOs and play action passing. And I think that's really big because it's less, especially if they they're like, Hey, we got to be mindful of the pass rush against new England and against the chargers. We're not going to turn our back to the defense quite as often. Mm-hmm. And it allows him. The one thing that he does have is a wide field of vision as a quarterback seeing short and coverage simultaneously. So I would not be surprised if you see mitigated play action passing in this game, but the offensive line has been, I think Butch Berry has been one of the acquisitions of the off season as the offensive line coach for the Dolphins. Like, like there's Isaiah wins a massive upgrade at left guard. Isaiah or Austin Jackson is an upgrade over Brandon shell, who they had in his place for 15 games last year. Never heard of him. He looks like, yeah, he's a sh- Buffalo Bills legend, Brandon Shell. Legend. Legend. <laughs> Very short stint. Uh, but Austin, th- the techniques that they've provided is giving him life as an NFL player. So it- it's, I think it's offensive line execution. I think it's how they're managing Tua Tungvalu's backfield responsibilities. And then it is also, this is a player that came into the league and was very RPO reliant. And the first year in Miami with Mike McDaniel, Connor Williams responsible for calling protections. I think you're seeing a lot more understanding. And I think having Vic Fangio and going against the Vic Fangio defense every day in practice and training camp, it has developed a sharper ability to understand and diagnose pressures and protections and know when I'm hot and get the ball out of my hands. And he's doing that. And then they have some scheme throws and they've, they've put in a screen game this off season too. So like it, it's not one thing. I think there's about five, six layers that all yeah. compound that have allowed this offense to be as, as efficient and uh, negative play averse as they've been in the first three weeks. Let's shift our focus to what has to go right for these teams to win the football game. And Kyle, for me, outside of the obvious taking care of the football, right? This is going to be an important game. You have to value possessions. Can't give them extra possessions. That that goes without stating. I think this is going to come down to red zone success. And you've talked about it already. Miami's been the best red zone offense in the NFL. First in the NFL, 11 of 14 mm-hmm. uh, trips, scoring a touchdown, 78.6%. That's the best in the NFL. Bills a really good red zone defense, 2 of 11, allowing touchdowns in the red zone. Uh, that's 28.6%, second best in the NFL. The Bills have been pretty good scoring touchdowns in the red zone. 8 of 13, 61.5%. That's 11th best. Dolphins defense, 7 of 11, 63.6%. That's 21st best. I think it's one of those games where, where you have when you have the ball, it's touchdowns, not field goals. When they have the ball, it's field goals, not touchdowns. And not to kind of like lean into this, but Jason Sanders has been a bit of a high-variance kicker here since yeah. that all-pro they, season. They, they, they can't kick beyond 49 yards. He cannot well, hit 50-plus yard field goals. So obviously that's that's not going to be in the red zone. He's going to be better from the shorter distances. But mm-hmm. 
it, you know, I think that's just a layer to it. So to me, if the Bills are going to win this game, it's taking care of the football and winning both sides of the ball when it comes to red zone opportunities. Yeah, I think I think Miami has to not lose the special teams battle. Just make it a stalemate. There's no reason every kickoff and ball shouldn't go out of the back of the end zone because guess what? Marvin Marvin Mims ran one back 98 yards on you, and the week prior you missed two field goals, including one that was blocked. They've had negative contributions on special teams each of the last two weeks. So Miami cannot that, – that has to become a stalemate. So if you're looking for an added edge, and I think this is a game that's won in the margins, special teams is a place to look. I think the thing for me is uh, Miami's ability to run the ball. You know, they had success the first, the second time they played them. They did not have success the first time they played them. They did not have success the third time they played them last year. Miami goes 41 rushing yards against the Bills. They score 21 points. They rush for 188. They score 29. And then they rush for 42, but they get three turnovers off Josh Allen, and they, they score 31 with Skylar Thompson in the playoff game. I think that feeds into your red zone point. I think if Miami's going to score and have success converting in the red zone against Buffalo, they have to be able to run the ball. And it has to come from a balanced attack. And if they are able to run the ball with success, I would expect this would be a game in which it's probably, I don't know, I don't have a good feel of conviction that it's either going to be on the edge inside or outside. Uh, I think they had some success in the second matchup where with the motion and how Buffalo was changing for formational strength based off of motion, they picked up on some stuff there and got plus gaps to the front side of runs. They've been a very successful uh, weak side of the formation run team in the past. That's a chess match within the chess match that I'll be watching. And I think really Miami's ability for all of the conversation that we had about Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell I do agree red zone will be critical. And for Miami's success, it's going to have to come from running the football consistently. Kyle, they make us uh, do a score prediction for this game. Uh, the Bills are favored by two and a half at home, and the over-under is currently at 53 and a half for points. Um, I'm the host of Locked On Bills. You're the host of Locked On Dolphins. I'm sure I'm picking the Bills. You're picking the Dolphins. Um, I can I Can I say this? I have every ounce of respect for Buffalo because of how much success they've had against the Dolphins. But yes, if the team starts three and zero, I'm the host of Locked On Dolphins. I gotta pick the Dolphins to win the game. I gotta believe, right? And you think I'm gonna sit in front of Bills Mafia right now and tell you that I think they're losing at home to Miami? Right. That ain't no, gonna happen. I, I wouldn't expect any. I would expect nothing less right. from you than to pick the Bills. I have a 33-31 Bills. I had 35-31 Dolphins. Ooh. So take the over on the points, ladies and gentlemen. All right, this has been fun. Kyle, we'll do it at least one more time. I'll see you uh, tomorrow for Lockdown NFL Scouting. So That's right. thanks for making this podcast your first listen, but make your second listen every day, Lockdown NFL Scouting, where Kyle and I talk NFL football from a team-building perspective every single day. So don't miss that. We appreciate you being here. There's plenty of more coverage coming your way on Lockdown Bills and Lockdown Dolphins the rest of the week. Thanks so much for joining us. As always, we kindly ask that you share, subscribe, rate, and review. Have a great rest of your day. We'll catch up with you again tomorrow.